and happy new year stackers. My name is Gina Abrams and I'm joined by Muni Bali, Stacks founder. This is Stacker Chats, your weekly update on all things Stacks and we're excited to kick off 2022 with you. Now, there's been an ongoing debate recently on what exactly makes up Web3. So Muneeb, what's your definition and how does Stacks fit in? Yeah, first of all, uh, happy 2022, everybody. I'm, I'm fired up for this year. I think this is this year is going to be great for all the all the work that we're doing. In terms of Web3, I think it's, it's very interesting that um, that term is almost making a comeback in the crypto industry. Um, I think the I've first seen the use of this term even back in like 2015 or 2020, 2016 in that time period, actually Gavin Wood from uh, Polkadot uh, was a big, uh, big early uh, person who started using the term Web three. Even, even I think the the foundation in that ecosystem is called the Web three Foundation, and so on. So it's interesting to see uh, the Web three term uh, making a comeback. Uh, I was personally like not a fan early on, but I think I'm I'm kind of like uh, warming up to it now because I think for the average internet user, um, it can make make a lot of sense. And I think it was the same like with Web the two terms as well. I think when Web2 term started, like I didn't like it initially, but I started kind of like warming up to it later on because it just it just makes it very simple for a broader audience to understand what's going on. But I think then, then the question that you're asking is the right one, that what exactly is the difference between, between these things? And I think at a very high level, the way I think about it is the Web1, the kind of like original web uh, was really about reading, right? So you could just read things online. You could go to like different websites and you're mostly reading stuff. It wasn't interactive. You couldn't write back. Uh, and I think Web2 was mostly about giving users um, the ability to write. So it became like read plus write. Interestingly, in the early days, um, there was a term called read write web that people were, were trying to actually use. Uh, but Web2 again is, was simpler, Web2.0 and it kind of like just, just took off. So I think that's where, you know, when users could write, meaning like you could write a Facebook post, you could write a tweet, you could write a blog, right? And it became a lot more interactive. And I think with Web3, it's basically, it keeps the features of the previous ones, right? So you could read, you could write, but now you can also own things. So you own Bitcoin, right? You own some other gas asset, like, like, like stacks or something, but you could also own digital assets like NFTs and, and other, other types of assets and, and so on. So, and that ability wasn't there before. Right. So you, even though you could write a tweet, you don't really own it because it, it lives on Twitter, the company. Right. So that's, that's kind of like the difference. So I think of that as like read, read plus write for web two, and then read plus write plus own uh, for web three, which I think is a very dramatic shift. I, we, we saw how big of a shift it was just going from read to, to read plus write. But I think the ownership aspect is actually a much bigger uh, delta shift uh, between the two. Absolutely. Thank you. Now, Bitcoin DeFi has been this unexplored space for so long, but we might expect more projects to come out. Um, you know, there's DeFi Chain, RSK, Liquid. Um, can you elaborate on the core differentiators for Stacks and what could really propel it to become a top project this year or down the line as compared to the rest? Yeah, so I think uh, I've been I've been in the Bitcoin space for a while, and I think the the core kind of like uh, lesson that I've I've learned is that for enabling Bitcoin to be productive, you really need two things, right? And both are critical. The first is fully expressive smart contracts. Like and this is something that we've actually experienced and tried. Like I think we tried doing more limited type of scripting language directly on Bitcoin. But the power of like a fully expressive contracting language is critical. And I think this is, this is now something that is well accepted in the industry. Like if you look at any smart contract platform, most of the ones that are thriving and have a lot of traction, they basically all use fully expressive smart contracts. Right? So, and I think that's, that's where we did a lot of work on clarity, which is expressive, yet it's safe, right? So it's not too incomplete. It's, it's kind of like you can build anything you want. But, but you don't have the kind of like potential problems that, that come with Turing complete languages. So that's the first thing. You absolutely need fully expressive contracts. And I think we have enough data now that, that this, is, this, this is just something that I think uh, is pretty clear at this point. But the second thing is less clear, I feel. And that second thing is you want 
Bitcoin to remain on the Bitcoin chain, right? So whenever you come up with a solution where you have to transfer Bitcoin uh, to something else, right? There are always security trade-offs and they usually end up being like some sort of a multi-seg uh, that, that you end up using and it, it's a centralization factor. And I think it's a, more importantly, it's a scalability problem, right? So, so think of, think of um, like Liquid or RSK. I'm not that familiar with DeFi chain, but uh, the little that I know about it right now, I do think they also have this, this multi-seg type, type of an approach. So, but, but because I'm not that familiar, I'm gonna leave them out uh, and just discuss kind of like Liquid and RSK. In both those cases, there is a Bitcoin derived asset that lives there, right? So uh, Liquid BDC, LBDC, you're basically trusting the, the holders of the multi-seg. Right, where you're sending your Bitcoin, that they're going to give you the Bitcoin back. Same with RSK. They have a slightly more sophisticated setup. Like they they have hardware multi-sig and you're kind of like trusting the people who are operating the hardware multi-sig. But that's how you get Bitcoin on that network. So let's see that let's say that you want to deploy like $10 million worth of Bitcoin into smart contracts. Sure. At some point you want to deploy 100 million, 500 million, a billion, 10 billion. At some point that multi-sig is just going to become a basically a ticking time bomb, right? You can't have $10 billion worth of assets going through a single point of failure, which is a multi-site wallet, right? Like how secure can it be, right? So the, the, the biggest bottleneck with these systems is really that you want, if you want to make Bitcoin productive, you have to make Bitcoin productive on the Bitcoin chain itself, because that's where Bitcoin is the, in its most secure form, right? In its most decentralized form. And that's the critical thing that people need to understand. And that's the problem that Stacks is trying to solve, where I think the applications built on Stacks, right now, we are in very early stages. So the early applications that you're seeing, they are obviously kind of like more uh, on the Stacks side, right? This year, you'll start seeing applications that, and that part of the application is actually on the Bitcoin side. Part of the application is on the Stacks side, because Stacks has this cross-chain consensus. So for example, uh, a lending application could operate where you are just doing a Bitcoin transaction and you're lending your Bitcoin and you're getting uh, the, your yield as Bitcoin back. So that's like truly native Bitcoin UX, right? Like anyone who has a Bitcoin wallet could be a participant in that in that application. But interestingly, if if that application starts getting traction and it goes like 100 million, 500 million, billions of dollars, Bitcoin is staying on the Bitcoin chain where it's secure. And I think that's a very critical point that people need to understand. So, so that's, I think that's the main difference between the approach that Stacks has, which it has a cross-chain consensus with Bitcoin. And there is less need. I think there's still a design space of having things like XBDC, which is a Bitcoin-derived uh, asset of Stacks. Uh, so you can program it, you can deploy it in smart contracts. But then with Stacks, you can actually do a BTC to XBTC trade as a native swap because Stacks has the cross-chain consensus. And that makes, makes the design space broader so people can do more interesting things. And I think the, the Bitcoin remaining on the Bitcoin chain and, and really unlocking that, uh, uh, that potential. And it could be that, you know, it maybe initially we'll just see a BTC to XBTC swap, and then people are using XBTC in applications, which is by the way, available today, right? And so, so interestingly, uh, one, of the, one of the applications that I would love to see uh, would be when Bitcoiners realize that they could actually do a BTC to XBTC trade, but they're not taking any price risk there. And they can uh, then use XBTC to mint a stable coin. That, that is a full decentralized loop, which is kind of like available today if people really dig through and, and want to do it, uh, to use Bitcoin as collateral and uh, basically mint a stable currency. Right. And I think, I think it's a little bit like, you know, the future is already here. It's just not widely distributed yet because not, not a lot of people are fully aware that these are the kind of really major things that, that uh, Stacks and, and the people uh, building these various components uh, have, have unlocked. Thank you. Now, pivoting a bit to a here related topic, can you speak a little bit about the API performance over the past few weeks and um, any potential improvements in progress. Yeah, so I think I uh, I saw some of that over the holidays. Clearly, you know, some developers were pretty pretty frustrated with it, and I I, I completely understand their frustration. If I'm a 
app developer and I'm using some service and that service kind of like goes down, obviously it impacts my, my uh, application as well. So I think the way to think about this is that the underlying infrastructure is fully decentralized, right? So this was not a Stacks blockchain issue. Uh, Stacks blockchain after, after the recent upgrade, uh, I've actually found it to be fairly reliable that I think with the new um, gas fee estimates and the clarity cost contracts that went live, like personally, just for me, like uh, I, I use various things on a daily basis, like I'm getting transactions through. I also am one of those people who probably pay like slightly higher fees than the average, but I'm, I'm, I'm getting my transactions through in a very reliable way. So this wasn't a, a Stacks blockchain issue. Uh, the, the, for while we're discussing the blockchain, I think the next unlock on the blockchain side would really be the scalability layers, like subnets work that I'm, I'm focused on, because that gives you like much, much faster transactions, and which is something that people uh, might see in, in some other ecosystems that trade off centralization for faster speed. And I think subnets can bring that uh, to the to the stacks ecosystem. But this was more of a, uh, a company is hosting an API. Uh, that makes it easy to interact with the underlying decentralized infrastructure. And that company, uh, company's deployment had an issue, right? And internally at Hero, like we're actually seeing tremendous growth, right? Like just over uh, the last, I don't want to get the stats wrong, but it's probably like four months or so. We have seen uh, API requests coming to Hero go from like 50 million per month to 100 million, 200, 250. I think it's, it's crossed like 300 million, might have crossed 350 million, I'll have to double check, but that's the trajectory, right? So this is just over the last four, maybe five months. So that that's a ton of load on our APIs and, and, and 5X growth over, over just a period of months. And, but that's amazing to see. And in general, uh, I would say relatively speaking, a centralized deployment of an API is easier to scale. I'm not saying that you know it's a straightforward type of thing, but relatively speaking, like you know, people have figured that out. Like this was the type of uh, work that any Web two company would have to do to scale out, right? Uh, so you deploy more servers, you do better load balancing, you have various kind of like you know, uh, engineering practices for making sure you have really high uptime and you. Uh, expect a lot of load. And I think Hero is going to do all of that. I'm very proud of our team. And I think they are they're working on making sure that the API is very reliable and scalable and, and so on. But the interesting thing that I noticed that you know once there was uh, the current API issues, there's a full postmortem that's like public on the forum and people can go and read that to know exactly what happened, why the API went down and how it came back online. But the one interesting thing that I noticed was that people were basically like, hey, look, the underlying infrastructure is decentralized. Uh, we can just actually deploy our own instance of the API. And I, I think that's amazing, even though like, you know, I work for Hero and we're in the business of building a really scalable API infrastructure uh, along with dev tools. I think that this is the power of decentralization that people could just be like, I could deploy my own API instance. And I think that that's great to see that builds resilience uh, in, in our ecosystem. And I would, I would encourage uh, more, more people to think on those lines that, hey, we can, we can have our own API. So if one uh, deployment is down, you, you could potentially use other ones. But in general, uh, I think running a uh, service that services like 300 million requests a month is, is, a, is pretty hard work. So you need to be dedicated to it. You, and, and I think Hero is in the business of doing that work. And we have the team that has the technical skills and, and the dedication to actually uh, follow, follow through on it. Thank you. And finally, new year, new profile pick on Twitter. We noticed that um, you're officially in the Megapont Ape family. Um, so I'm curious, can you elaborate on sort of what you're most excited for this year um, in regards to that social engagement of crypto communities? Yeah, so I think I've been experimenting with NFTs and just, I think I love the community. I love the aspect of like having this bond with other community members. And uh, and I think uh, I I had my eye on this ape, but it was pretty, pretty expensive. And so I, I think I thought about buying it earlier on. Then I was like, ah, no, I'll, I'll buy some other things. Then I was thinking about like, hey, it would be nice to experiment, like putting your profile picture as NFTs. Uh, mostly like, I think I, I learned by really playing around with things myself. Uh, so it's more of an experiment for me that, hey, let's just, let's just try that. And when I wanted to change the profile picture, I just went back to that ape. I was like, that was a, that was, that was a good one. Let me just go back and pull the trigger. Uh, and, and it's interesting. Like, I feel it's, it's like, 
A weird thing that I've noticed is that um, with the ape picture, I feel more comfortable just speaking whatever I want to speak. Like, it's not that I wasn't comfortable before, but there's this like weird thing that, hey, you're you're talking to an ape, right? That like, you're not talking to Muneen and the ape can say whatever the ape wants to say. So it's a, it's a very interesting dynamic that I feel. And, and another thing that I noticed that some people pointed out, um, some people thought that my laser eyes on Twitter were a sign of like Bitcoin maximalism. I didn't realize that because I'm just doing that as a Bitcoiner. But the laser eyes have become a symbol, not for Bitcoin, but for maximalism. I, I did not fully realize that, right? So some people are like, oh, it's so great to see that you're getting rid of your Bitcoin maxi uh, symbol and are joining kind of like the, uh, the, the Web3 DGENs. I'm like, I, it wasn't my intention, but if it comes across like that, I, I'm not, I'm a, I'm a Bitcoin centrist. I'm, I'm, I'm not a maximalist at all. So if that signals it, like, like all the better. Fascinating. Well, thanks for sharing that. And I'm excited to see all the, the projects and developments that come to life this year. Uh, well, thank you so much for being here, Maneev. And thanks to all of our subscribers. If you enjoy this content, please do make sure that you're subscribed. Um, like this video and leave us a comment with any feedback or questions. We'll see you next week. Awesome. Thanks so much. Bye.